Hello, everyone. Welcome to the series, Mud Talks, GPS, It's True and Amazing Story with John Labracas, Class of 74. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending and we hope you and your family are safe and healthy during this time. This talk is being recorded and will be distributed along with any presentation materials after the event. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat, and we will try to get through as many questions as we can after the presentation. Now, to briefly introduce our speaker, uh, speaker John Labracas, Class of 74, is president of Advanced Research Corporation, where he provides consulting and research and development services on satellite navigation. He most recently served as a subject matter expert on the global navigation sys satellite system for the John A. Volt National Transportation System Center. I now turn it over to you, John, take it away. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Vanessa. And uh, greetings, everyone. Um, it's, I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, and I was looking through the attendance list and just so many names of people I know, uh, good friends and, and family. So. I'm going to switch over now to share my screen and we'll get get underway. So hopefully everyone can see me. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking to you uh, about my career, really, uh, GPS, um, and give you some background on it, some names and faces, but I'm not going to drag you through a history lesson, um, but I'll talk about some historical events that happened and my perception of it and how my career kind of fit into it all. So let's get started. So I'm a mudder, uh, class of 74, North Dorm for four years, uh, graduated in a five-year program uh, we had back then uh, in mathematics. Uh, it trained me to become a teacher at the community college level. And uh, so I taught um, in Indiana at a vocational technical college for three years. But then I decided to move into aerospace and uh, I moved to San Pedro, California and uh, got a job there. Um, I'm not the only mutter in GPS. Uh, there's many uh, people I know of and I'm sure there's many more. Scott Pace, who uh, wrote a book on national policy for GPS and was on National Space Council. Uh, Angela Dorsey at JPL, I've talked to her before. And Calvin Miles at the FAA uh, has been uh, someone I've worked along uh, for many years. GPS, we know that it tells you where you are. Um, this slide I like because it's a, a map from Germany uh, used all over the world. Uh, we know that it's used for uh, aircraft, for en route uh, navigation, uh, terminal approach and landing. Uh, it's used on um, vessels, marine vessels. And you can see a GPS antenna at the top, the little round circle. I'm pretty used to uh, seeing those uh, whenever I look around for those GPS antennas. Uh, they're used for fishing, for harbor entry and approach. Um, invaluable, uh, invaluable use. Uh, farming, uh, GPS provides positioning within inches. And so it allows farmers to be more uh, um, efficient in their uh, application of herbicides and pesticides, putting on just what they need in um, sowing their seeds and in harvesting. It's all um, using GPS for, enabled by GPS. Machine control systems, uh, civil engineering, excavation is all done with GPS. Uh, one of my sons sold uh, Caterpillar tractors and you couldn't buy one almost without getting a GPS unit to go with it. Uh, the money, what's the money? <laughs> um, GPS uh, provides time. Uh, all bank transactions now are uh, synchronized with GPS time. Uh, the internet, uh, cell towers all have GPS receivers in them to synchronize time. The power grid, that 60 hertz um, phase power is monitored with GPS. So it's critical, in fact, over 90% percent of the uses, I think it's up around there, is um, timing uh, applications. Um, now, GPS is part of our um, United States Code in Title 10, Section 2281. It states that uh, GPS will be provided 
free of direct user fees. So GPS comes to you courtesy of the United States taxpayer. But there's a lot of benefits from it. I thought I'd take you a, a look under the hood. Um, the constellation here you see is the GPS constellation with 24 satellites. That's the number on paper, um, six orbits uh, in 55 degree inclination and uh, four satellites per orbital plane. Uh, the actual number is 31 satellites. Um, there are uh, more satellites than spec because um, they're lasting longer than the manufacturers had um, had made them for. So some of them last into 20 years, over 20 years old. The satellites are managed at uh, Schriever Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. I spent a number of years out there uh, supporting that operation. Uh, the U.S. Space Force is at the master control station there where they collect data from around the world uh, monitor stations, uh, generate uploads that go up to the satellites to uh, provide the latest information to broadcast to the users. They use a network of ground antennas, which are large dishes that track the satellites for telemetry, commanding and control. Um, they sit inside these ray domes and they're usually located in beautiful spots um, around the equator. In fact, here's a map uh, showing uh, where a lot of these stations are. Um, uh, draw your attention to Colorado. Uh, there you see a, um, a red diamond with a circle in it. That's the master control station. Now there's also a blue pentagon next to it, down below it. And you can see several of these, one in Cape Canaveral in Florida, one in Hawaii, um, Kwajalein Island, Diego Garcia in the uh, Indian Ocean and out in Ascension Island. These are the monitor stations the Space Force has to collect the signals from the, um, from the satellites and take that data and send it back to the master control station. Uh, there's also a network of the round donuts, the little red donut circles. Those are um, stations uh, managed by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA. Uh, they use them in order to support their mission for providing a precise uh, mapping for the military. Those stations are also, uh, they also feed into the master control station to provide 16 stations with data uh, to feed the Kalman filter, which is generate, generating state estimates for all the satellites, their uh, position and their time. Now, a lot of people ask, well, how does GPS work? And they think it's triangulation, but technically it's multilateration. We're not measuring angles, we're measuring distances, and it deals with uh, time distance of arrival. If, oh, uh, if I know where a, a site is and I know my distance to the site, I could be anywhere on a circle in two dimensions. In 3D, it would be anywhere on a sphere, but it doesn't really tell me where I'm at. If I have two known locations and I know my distance to each, I could be in either of two spots, basically. There's an ambiguity which spot you're in. But if you have three known locations, and you know your distance to each, then you know pretty much where you are in that little triangle. So GPS is solving what would we'd think would be three equations with three unknowns to get, get X, Y, Z, X, Y, and Z. But actually there's a fourth uh, value that needs to be calculated. In order to, to know your distance to the uh, satellite, you have to know what time the signal left and when you received it. If you know that difference in time, you multiply it by the speed of light and that tells you how far away the satellite is. Um, the problem is, um, well, we know what time the signal left the satellite because the satellites have on board precise atomic clocks. Uh, they're either cesium or rubidium clocks and we know exactly what time it is. But the GPS receiver you have in your um, cell phone is just a crystal 
oscillator, and it's not very accurate at all. So we'll solve for that time bias. And so that's our fourth unknown. And so we solve four equations. We need four satellites in view to get our X, Y, Z, and time. Now, the primary signal from GPS is called the L1. Uh, it broadcasts at 1575.42 megahertz. And uh, modulated on top of that is a pseudo random noise course acquisition or CA code. And when I say pseudo random, what I mean is it appears to be random, but it's actually not random, it's, it's well known. So if I had a signal 01010101, well, that's not random at all. But if it's like 00111011000111, you'd go, well, there's no order to that. <clears throat> there's an algorithm that generates these codes that's known on the satellite, so it generates a code. And in the receiver, it generates the same code. And uh, when the signal's received, they're able to uh, take these two codes and match them and get what's called a, a correlation. And when that match happens, then you can figure out the distance to the satellite because you've got it locked on. That's code division multiple access. Uh, and every satellite has its own unique pseudo random noise code called the PRN. Now modulated on top of that set of codes is the data. Um, remember, I told you, you need to know where the satellite's located. Well, the satellite knows where it is because the ground told it where it is, and it broadcasts that into the data stream. And so you have three sets of signals uh, all working together. It's extremely low power, the signal. It's less than 500 watts, 12,500 miles away. So you can imagine with the uh, inverse square law that there's not much power that arrives um, at your receiver. Uh, there's free space loss, atmospheric loss, antenna loss. But because of spread spectrum technology, the code division multiple access, uh, you can add about 43 decibels in process gain. Now here's my story, best way I can explain CDMA. Uh, when I was a kid, I'd go shopping with my mom and my sisters and I would lose my mom in the store. At least I would get lost. And you had a store filled with noise, lots of people talking. And, but I knew what my mother's voice sounded like uh, because she was known to me. And because I knew her voice, I could hear it above the noise. And so I could go find her and, and be together again. That's how it works in GPS. There's noise out there in the frequency uh, that GPS uses. But the signal is known in advance by the receiver, and it's able to pull that signal out of the noise. It's a great concept. Now, the L1 is not the only frequency. There's three other frequencies in development. Uh, L2C is at 1227 megahertz, L5 at 1176, and L1C is also at 1575, just like the L1CA. And you could ask, well, why are there all these signals? Well, it turns out that as the signal passes through the ionosphere, it's, uh, there's a refraction that takes place. And, you can, uh, and, and as a result of delay, you can calculate this amount of delay by an algorithm that uses two frequencies. So the L1CA combined with the L2C will get you a correction for the ionosphere. The L5 signal was put in because that's in a safety of life band, a special band reserved for aviation. And that's a very important signal for the uh, aviation uh, community. The L1C is in the same frequency as the L1CA, but it uses a different coding sequence and um, a data sequence. That was hammered out with the Europeans in 2004 so that as we implement the L1C, they would also implement it. And so we'd have a compatible system. There's also signals available for military use that are encrypted and uh, just not generally available to uh, civil users. Some people have asked about relativity. It's a very important part of uh, the GPS position and time calculation. Because the satellites are um, 
12,000 miles up, they're at a different gravity potential. So we have to implement the general theory uh, in order to account for a difference in gravity and the time dilation. Likewise, the uh, special relativity applies for the satellites that are moving so quickly. They're over 8,000 miles an hour, and we have to account for special relativity as well. Um, what you see here is a photograph of the uh, vice president's house, the United States Naval Observatory in Washington, DC, where um, they manage the universal coordinated time for the military, UTC. Um, and that time is uh, a reference time that's used internationally, um, along with other uh, nation states computation of their own UTC, but they're all very close. Um, GPS time is managed to stay within UTC uh, by a very uh, close amount. And on the left, you see a picture of the master clock at the US Naval Observatory. Being a mathematician, I like numbers. So I thought I'd throw some up here at you. The 12,500 miles, you probably guessed, it's the altitude of a GPS satellite above the earth. Six billion. That's a order of magnitude estimate of how many GPS receivers there are in the world. Uh, there's a lot of cell phones out there. 24, that's the spec number of number of satellites um, that are in a nominal constellation. 15 feet is about the accuracy, about five meters uh, of a GPS position fix without any assistance. Three nanoseconds is how closely GPS time matches UTC. Two centimeters is how accurate you can get using some of the um, uh, existing augmentations that are out there. So you can improve on your GPS position by using additional um, methods. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. And to me, the fascinating number is the number eight. Um, Six billion users out there all relying on GPS. At the master control station, at any given time, there are only eight personnel running this amazing system. Um, and so I'm just really excited that uh, we have a system that is um, so dependable, so well developed. It's a very mature system. There's algorithms, there's computers, there's redundancy, and the system is just run by eight people at any given time. Now, a little bit of the history lesson. Um, it all started, satellite navigation, the concept of it started with the Sputnik that went up in October of 1957. Um, when the uh, Russia, the Soviet Union launched that satellite, it sent out a tone, a beep, and uh, scientists listened to that and they realized that when it came closer, the pitch was higher, and when it went farther, went away, it went lower, and so you had a Doppler effect. And they began to use that effect to determine where the satellite was in its orbit. Well, within days, scientists at the Applied uh, Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University realized that if we knew where the satellites were and we had the Doppler tone, we could figure out where we were on the Earth. And so they developed a system called the Transit Satellite Program, Navigational Satellite. And that's the image you see on the right. And it was fielded in the early 60s, a system to provide worldwide navigation. But it wasn't very good. It was slow, hard to use, and it wasn't very accurate. So there were a couple of key people among many. And really, the story of GPS is the many people that made it happen. On your left is uh, a gentleman who is the president of Aerospace Corporation, Yvonne Getting. Um, he realized that we could do better than transit, and he pushed to get a, um, a system like GPS going. Um, and, it, and so that was kind of the start of it. The Navy got a program going, the Army got one going, they came together and they formed a joint program office and they put in charge this young um, colonel, our, uh, Air Force Colonel Brad Parkinson, the guy on the right. He was in his 30s and he was in charge of starting up the uh, 
GPS program. He called it Navstar, Global Positioning System. And uh, Brad was really the enabler for making this happen. On a weekend in, uh, on Labor Day weekend in 1973, a group, he pulled together a group of uh, experts and they designed the system in just the weekend. Um, largely, there's many details that had to be worked out, but it was quite an amazing entrepreneurial effort, I would say. Now, GPS has had thousands of people working on it. Uh, Brad and Yvonne were leaders, but there's just worker people, like I have been working for 40 years to help support this program. And one person I want to bring to your attention is Gladys West, an American mathematician at the Naval Proving Ground in Dahlgren, Virginia. She helped develop the reference ellipsoids and geodetic uh, models that were used in GPS. Here's a group of people at the top of Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs. In 1993, a group of us decided to survey Pikes Peak. It was before GPS was fully operational, um, but used GPS to do the survey. And we were part of the Institute of Navigation. And you can see um, me here, the uh, fourth person from the right. And next to me is a guy, Chris Shank, who um, was a captain in the Air Force. And he and I worked together on a number of uh, activities at the base at the master control station. And he eventually went on in a career uh, to work for the White House and, and be active in uh, space programs. Uh, the woman next to him in the red top is uh, Dr. Penny Axelrad, a professor at University of Colorado in Boulder, who has educated many students on the applications of GPS in space. These other people, I wish I could remember their names, but I can't, uh, but I know that many of them were uh, either working at the Air Force Base, uh, running GPS, or they were part of uh, contractors helping to develop GPS. Last year, um, the Space Force uh, made history by having an all-female crew um, do uh, satellite operations for GPS-3, uh, one of the newest satellites that are up there. So there you count them, eight people who run GPS. Now let's take a step back. Um, many people have asked, was GPS originally for civilian use or just for military? And I believe that it was primarily military. There was talk of civilian uh, use, but it wasn't until 1983 when a tragedy occurred. Uh, the Korean airline flight 007 with over 200 people on board was flying south out of Anchorage, Alaska, and it was using inertial navigation, um, which tends to drift. It's not supposed to, but it, it just can't hold its position the way GPS does today. And it drifted over Sakhalin Island, which was a highly classified facility for the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviets decided it was a spy plane and they shot it down. And it was a worldwide tragedy. President Reagan, Ronald Reagan said, this should not happen. We are developing a global positioning system. We're gonna make it available for civilian use so that these types of things will never happen again. So to me, that was a turning point in the use of GPS for civilian applications. Now, uh, in 1989, the Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound in Alaska. Um, some attributed it to uh, navigation problems. After um, the president said GPS would be made available for civilian use, um, the military, the Department of Defense, was imposing an error on the signal so that it was never more accurate than 100 meters. Um, so I told you 15 foot error, five meter error. Well, no one was getting that in the civilian world. Well, the Coast Guard said, we can, we can remove this error. We're gonna develop what's called a differential GPS system. And it's called differential because it's a difference of two numbers. You get a, a GPS receiver at a fixed known location, a very tightly surveyed point, and then you calculate the position using the satellites. You're gonna have this error up to 100 meters. We'll just send that error by a transmission to all the users in the area. They can subtract that error 
and now they have a good location. So the Coast Guard started the maritime DGPS system to counter the uh, military imposed error. 1991 happened February um, and the United States um, went into uh, rescue uh, uh, Kuwait. And it was a very fast operation, took about five days. And the reason was in large part because of GPS. Um, you can see a soldier there with a handheld unit and they were able to move quickly across featureless terrain and uh, accomplish what they needed to do. Now, during that time, because um, there was no military equipment to use uh, this uh, error to account for the error, they turned it off and used civilian grade receivers. And we know there were a lot of uh, moms and pops that were sending, uh, they were buying equipment at stores and giving it to their, their sons to take um, with them in the military operation. I remember working at uh, Master Control Station and we were getting handwritten letters from military people thanking us for providing GPS. So they were very uh, pleased with it. Now the Coast Guard was um, modifying GPS or providing augmentation to GPS, a differential system. Well, the FAA realized they needed to do it as well. Um, they were correcting for the error on uh, GPS for aircraft and also providing what's called an integrity message. They would monitor the GPS signals and if any of them was uh, not valid, large errors, they would uh, notify the aircraft not to use it. And so they developed the wide area augmentation system, which was a network of monitor stations around the uh, North America. They would uh, broadcast from geosynchronous satellites the corrections to um, the aircraft along with the integrity message. Well, in May of 2000, President Clinton um, issued a new policy that selective availability, that's the term for this military imposed error, would be turned off. He said to do it on May 1st, and we said, respectfully, sir, uh, it takes us a day to talk to all the 24 satellites, so it won't be until May 2nd. But on May 2nd, the SA, this intentional degradation of 100 meters was shut off. And we were, I was at the GPS support center and watching that happen. So I put up a little picture of that. May 3rd, the next day, geocaching began, yay. And in fact, it started up in Beaver Creek, Oregon up where I live. So that's a fun recreational activity for many people today. They could finally find those little boxes. GPS equipment um, started pretty large. Uh, you can see the unit on the left with a hefty antenna. It's probably got a lot of batteries in it. It's called the Man Pack. Um, I would not want to carry one of those around. By Desert Storm Time, 1991, they were handheld units. And today, they're the size of millimeters. They're just little chips that sit inside your phone. It's pretty amazing, and they're a lot cheaper. My career in GPS started with development of the ground control system. Um, I worked in, um, uh, in, um, Colorado Springs, but I started in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I want to tell you a little story. Um, how I got into GPS was because of an elevator talk I had. Um, I was in San Pedro, California, finishing up a project, got on the elevator, ran into a guy, Gordon Small, who was a colleague. I worked with him, but also played hearts with him at lunchtime. He knew how good I was at hearts. And he said, what you doing, John? I said, well, I'm finishing up a remote sensing satellite project. He said, would you come on GPS? And I said, I'd be very interested. He said, well, we have two opportunities. One is in San Pedro, California. The other one's in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I said, well, my wife and I are leaving tomorrow morning on a trip across country. We're gonna drive through Washington, DC. And so we'll check it out and let you know when we get back. He said, okay. And that was it, we arrived at our floor. And 40 years later, um, I'm still, 
uh, work in GPS. So now when I started uh, at the master control station, um, it was at Falcon Air Force Base, which is now called Schriever Air Force Base. Uh, you can see a building in the right there uh, with no windows. That's where I worked. Every day when I went into work, there was a sign that said restricted area, photography prohibited. In 1993, GPS completed a certification for initial operations capability. It was no longer a development program. It became an operational program. And the next day, the sign on it said, restricted area use of deadly force authorized. So I never forgot that. It's like, okay, the things have changed here. Uh, and no, I didn't take a photograph of this. Uh, I found this on the web, but I still remember uh, those signs. Now, I worked um, on the development of the uh, ground control until 1995. And I got involved in some internal research at our company. And uh, we were looking at uh, applying GPS for tracking solutions. Um, the company was not going to take it into the commercial world. So I left the company and started my own company, Advanced Research Corporation. And we developed a product called Starwatch that would use a PC. You can imagine the 1995 PCs were kind of large and it was Windows 95 and uh, analog cellular for communications and the Orbcom low earth orbit satellites. And the idea is we could track things anywhere. It was a really cool time. Um, scary because uh, I had no income. <laughs> uh, my wife was very supportive uh, during that time. But we had a lot of cool projects. One was a private investigator who wanted to track stolen jewelry. So we built a box with a false bottom and a GPS receiver in it. Um, we tracked weather balloons for NOAA, uh, ocean sensors for Oregon State University. I had a big contract with General Motors, Electromotive Division to track locomotives. And I demoed my Starwatch project in Caracas, Venezuela for tracking fleets of vehicle. That said, I was not successful in getting this going. I'm no, not a multimillionaire, it just didn't happen. The, the mid 90s, was a time when no one knew about GPS and I had to explain what it was. And I only sold a dozen of these systems and finally had to let it go. In 2007, uh, my wife and I left Colorado Springs and we moved to Newport, Oregon. And I got involved with the Hatfield Marine Science Center who was uh, using GPS for locating where uh, salmon were caught. And we came up with an idea of um, providing to consumers in restaurants information on where their seafood was caught. And this was really driven in the Gulf of Mexico. People were concerned about overfishing in the Gulf and uh, the deep water hor uh, horizon oil spill. They didn't want their seafood to come from anywhere near that. So we were asked to develop a system where uh, people could go into a restaurant, order seafood, scan a QR code and found out where that fish was caught and who caught it. So uh, we call it Fish Tracks Marketplace. And today, if you go to Gulf, Gulf Shores, Alabama, you can go into Lulu's restaurant and uh, find out where your seafood was caught. There's a lot of other cool ways GPS is being used. Uh, talk about a few of them. Uh, earthquake monitoring up and down the coast of uh, the West Coast of the United States are stations. Uh, these all feed precise data into um, uh, monitoring centers where they're looking at um, the movement of the earth and a lot of scientific research is going on with that. Uh, the signals that pass through the atmosphere are delayed. I mentioned the ionosphere. They're also delayed by in the troposphere by uh, the water vapor content well, if we know uh, where a station is and where the satellites are, we can back out the signal, figure the delay is due to water vapor and measure the water vapor in the atmosphere. So we're using GPS for water vapor monitoring. Uh, here's some little devices. A uh, picture I took at Hatfield Marine Science Center for uh, tracking where uh, marine life uh, are going. 
um, seals, sea lions, uh, sharks um, using GPS. Some cases they transmit the data back through Argo satellite. Some case they just collect it and we have to retrieve the device and download it. Landing aircraft, that's not an exciting new um, uh, application. I think you all know about that, but I wanted to tell the story because when I was flying one time in a small Cessna, commercial flight from Portland to Newport, um, I asked the pilot, uh, could you fly a GPS approach? I asked him to do it. We have an ILS instrument landing system in Newport, but I wondered if he would do a, a GPS approach. The FAA has uh, created uh, GPS approaches for thousands of airports around the United States, um, most of which don't have instrument landing systems. They can't afford it, but they can get precise landing using GPS. So we took off. He turned around, handed me this sheet. It was called the approach plan for Newport, showing the glide slope and the heading you, you take to get in. And then when we got close, he asked for it back, which was, I gave it to him back and um, I could look out the front of the aircraft and I could see not much. I could see on the radar, just a mess of um, uh, clouds um, all around us. And then as we got close to the airport, he came below the, uh, the ceiling of the clouds and we were perfectly lined up over the runway and within seconds we landed. And I was pretty happy about being part of GPS then. So that's my story on that. There are some issues with GPS. Um, it doesn't work really well indoors. That's a very low power signal, which just does not go through the walls and the ceilings, especially when there's metal in there. Also, as you can see on the right-hand side, um, if you're in a city, we call that the urban canyon, um, where instead of rock walls, you have uh, buildings which just knock out the line of sight signals from the satellites or they cause reflections, a single or multiple reflections, which makes it really hard for a GPS receiver to figure out which signal is the right one and which isn't. Um, one time we went to our niece's wedding in Boston and I'll tell you, the GPS was just wacko. It wasn't working at all. Um, too many buildings around. So those are some issues that uh, GPS has. Uh, Several years ago at Newark Airport, um, while airplanes were landing, they noticed that the um, uh, GPS went out at certain times. Now it's next to the New Jersey Turnpike. The FAA asked the FCC to look into it and they were able to isolate it to a, a, a man that was driving a truck for his employer and he didn't want to be tracked. So he bought a jamming device and plugged it into his cigarette lighter. And it worked, it jammed GPS so he wasn't tracked, but it also took out landing for the aircraft at the airport. SCC was not happy. So he was fined $32,000. It is illegal to operate a jammer. Uh, federal law does not permit it in our country or in any other country. So that's an issue now where people think they can put on jammers and uh, it causes real problems. Another insidious problem, uh, less likely, but it, it's there, especially by um, uh, other uh, nation states, is a spoofing. Uh, what that is is sending out a signal that looks like a GPS signal, but it isn't. And with it, you can cause incorrect positions to be recorded. So uh, there's a vessel somewhere in there in one location, but the GPS is reporting many different locations because of the spoofing effect. With GPS tied into our, not only positioning, but our timing systems, the Department of Commerce has figured that a 30 day loss of GPS would cause $30 billion in economic harm, not to mention safety of life implications. You don't want your aircraft to be, um, have any problem when it's landing. So the next step is to um, implement resilience methods. Uh, with the satellites, they're uh, putting on higher power signals. Um, users 
are putting in improved antennas. There are now available directional antennas that will listen to satellites, but not other sources of signal. Uh, protections against spoofing using authentication methods and alternate positioning technologies like inertial sensors, barometric altimeters, radar, LIDAR, cameras, map matching, Wi-Fi, cellular signals, lots of different um, means to um, determine where you're at. The, um, some of these take a while and some, the authentication requires changing the satellites. That will take years. Um, the alternate positioning technologies can be done much faster than that. Now in GPS or the Global Navigation Satellite Services, we are not alone. Uh, since um, for several decades now, the uh, Russia has had the GLONASS system, uh, which is like GPS, but it's their own system. Europe now has putting up Galileo. Uh, it's not operational, but it will be soon. And China has the Beidou uh, navigation satellite system, which went operational last July. Those are what are called global navigation satellite systems. So the new term is GNSS. GPS is our system, but GNSS refers to all the systems. Japan is, put a, is putting up their own regional satellite system that flies over Japan called Quasi-Zenith Satellite System. And India has a system they're developing called NAVIC. Because all these systems are being developed, the United Nations uh, created an international committee on GNSS. And uh, that committee really fosters compatibility of the systems, interoperability, uh, having common standards and services, uh, international monitoring of, of each other's signals and sharing of data. And I've been uh, really pleased to be part of this program for the last five and a half years. Um, we held a workshop there two years ago in Vienna and here's a picture uh, we have. I'm the guy way on the left over here and next to me are people from China, United States, Russia, um, Europe and Japan. So it's it's been really a great experience to work alongside these people as we uh, come together with um, common solutions and uh, work by consensus. We're not telling each other what to do, but we agree on what's the best way forward. Uh, almost, well, over 10 years ago, I participated in a um, uh, a study on the future of positioning, navigation, and timing. PNT is the term for all uh, the umbrella of P, uh, positioning, navigation, and timing. And uh, we had 31 departments, the government departments and agencies got together, military, civilian, and we looked at the future and we realized the future involved multiple GNSS, ground-based system, terrestrial systems, and autonomous systems, systems that don't rely on someone to give you a signal. You just are able to determine where you are from your own sensors. So that's kind of where G, uh, PNT is going. It's a hybrid of many, many uh, different technologies. So here's an example. The Garmin Phoenix 6X has GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, also a barometric altimeter, a three axis compass and gyroscope. So that's the future of PNT. Um, drones are used using GPS, but all the other sensors, you can see the two white GPS antennas at the top of that drone. Um, and here's a Tesla with a person not driving it. Um, and it, uh, it's got cameras on it, it's got radar, it's got all kinds of technologies fused into it, along with GPS. GPS is there to provide navigation, um, but the um, there's many other technologies used for um, the actual uh, performance in the driving. So what we have is a system that was designed for military needs uh, with an idea that it could be used for civilian. Uh, 
It is truly a dual use system now. It's used for military and civilian, where most of the uses are civilian. Um, and and for me, it's been a career that has been amazing. Um, I often tell people I've never had a day I haven't enjoyed going to work. And I really believe that. It's been exciting to have worked on GPS for over 40 years now. So um, if you want to explore more, uh, there are some places to go. There's lots of different places. If you just want the current trends, uh, there's a couple of magazines. GPS World is one and Inside GNSS. Uh, just Google those. If you want to know more about government policy, uh, gps.gov is the website. If you go to that, you'll find um, lots of information about uh, the uh, government policy on GPS. And if you want to understand the technical state of the art, the Institute of Navigation, a group I've been involved with over many decades, um, is a place to go. They're the scientists and the um, operators that get together and uh, help formulate uh, solutions, just amazing solutions. And I, I really do thank you all for being here today. It's exciting uh, to be able to talk to you. Now, it's question time and I've gotten a lot of questions in and I want to give some deference to those that took time to write the questions. So I'm going to go ahead and, and run through those. Um, one of the questions was, the GPS signal's weak. Is there another system that can function as a backup? And this is a great question. Um, it's one that government has been grappling with and the Department of Transportation uh, had a headed up a study on looking at um, alternate solutions called complementary PNT. And you can find it on gps.gov. Just look under DOT reports to Congress and you'll find the report. Uh, they looked at over a dozen different systems um, that could act as backups to GPS. Someone said, I'd love to hear about the modernized signals as well as Beidou and Galileo. Well, what they mean by modernized is, remember the primary signal is L1. There's new signals coming, um, the L2C, L5, and L1C. The L2C today is available on 23 of the satellites. Those are the block 2RMs. Then a next class of satellite, the 2F was launched. Uh, that's on 16 satellites. And then the final set, the GPS-3 satellites were launched with the L1C. So that's the pace of when they're coming on. I'm not going to take any time. I don't have time to go into the different differences between the signals. All you know is, you should know is that there are improvements on the previous signals. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Oops. Siri's waking up over here. Um, none of these signals is operational, uh, fully operational. L2C can be used for ranging, but not positioning. Not until you have 24 satellites will there be a full operational capability. Also, having the satellites is not enough. There also has to be a ground control system that monitors those signals. And right now we don't have that. It'll be several years before that is uh, implemented uh, at the master control station. So basically we have satellites in orbit, but we don't have a really a good way to talk to them and take advantage of all their features yet. Someone asked, which launch vehicles have you used? I think this was Ted Gibson, one of my classmates. Um, the answer is originally the Delta II was used and now the Falcon 9. Uh, why do we pick those? They're dependable. The Delta II went time after time after time with no failures. There was one failure with the GPS satellite, um, but there was a huge record of dependability. Falcon 9, same way. And it also has big savings, the Falcon 9 because it's reusable. What additional functionality was added each time the system was upgraded? Basically new signals and higher power. And there are, aren't gonna be any more signals than the four that I mentioned for civilian use. How long do the GPS satellites last? Why are they inoperative? What type of fuel? Well, 
they're spec to be, depending on the age, the older ones were 10 years, they were spec, and then 12 and a half and 15, but they're lasting 20 to 25 years. Um, they become inoperative uh, for two major reasons that I'm aware of, the reaction wheels, which are momentum wheels that control the attitude of the satellite, which is critical for GPS, because you have to point those um, antennas towards the earth, and the solar panels degrade in space. Those are the two things I'm aware of that causes a satellite to fail. The fuel is hydrazine, but it typically doesn't run out. They, they're very good about protecting that supply. And uh, they do keep fuel back for final disposal. At the end of life for a GPS satellite, they push it out to a higher orbit. So it doesn't get in the way of existing satellites. In the early days of design and satellite building, did anyone envision, envision what an important public utility GPS would become? Anyone? I'm sure lots of people envisioned it, but one person I think really did was Brad Parkinson. I remember when he was at Stanford, he invited farmers to come out and see this tractor he had outfitted, he and his team really, with GPS, and um, was able to show them, not just talk to them, but show them what GPS can do. My own feeling was after 1983, I realized that GPS would be available for uh, commercial civil use. Um, but I do want to say that um, it was, uh, well, hold off. I'll, I've got one more question on this. I'm going to give you more information. Uh, some comment on recognition of failure modes for aircraft instrumentation. Uh, the failure modes for aviation are managed with the wide area augmentation system and something called RAIM, which is in the receiver. It's called Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. And the concept is simple that um, you need four satellites to get a position, but if you have more than that, you have more signals. And at any one time, there are seven to 11 GPS satellites in view you can use those extra satellites to check the signals to see if any of them are erroneous. And we've had some spectacular failures in the past where a satellite started broadcasting an erroneous signal that was hundreds of kilometers off and it caused GPS receivers to think they're somewhere else. So uh, WAS, RAIM, those are technologies that protect against that. Um, the pilots are trained in backup, so if GPS does fail, they'll be told and then they'll go to their backup, which may be VOR or DME or some other system. Uh, briefly compare GPS and GLONASS from a user's perspective. Um, to the user, to you and me, there's no difference. It's just a satellite network that provides your positioning, navigation, and timing. GPS, Galileo, and Beidou all use the code division multiple access. GLONASS uses frequency division multiple access, which means in order to listen to any one satellite, they actually change the frequency. They jump around between frequencies. Whereas GPS, Galileo, and Beidou track one frequency, but they jump around on the codes, those pseudo random noise codes. There is some design, upfront design, so it's non recurring expenses, but um, they've overcome that. My iPhone 5 had GLONASS in it, so it's just a little chip now, so there's no real impact. How do you feel about new satellites, um, satellite constellations like SpaceX's Starlink? Well, that's, um, how do I feel? <laughs> um, there's a little bit of excitement and concern. Uh, increasing technology availability is cool, but I went to Harvey Mudd, and one of the things you learned at Harvey Mudd is we need to think about our technology and its impact on the world. Harvey Mudd and that started after the atomic bomb. And it's like we as engineers need to think about our impact. And so there's a concern with these satellite constellations about collision in low Earth orbit and uh, the clutter they cause for observing space from Earth. I would say those are some concerns. But I, I really can't comment more because I'm not an expert in the area of SpaceX's Starlink. Did the level of GPS integration with consumer electronics uh, surprise you? Um, that was the thing I was going to tell you about. Um, 
Yes, in a sense that I, I'm amazed that you can hold it all in your hand and, and get so many uh, apps uh, to do cool things. But people don't know, the FCC uh, mandated that uh, to support 911, when you call and you ask for help, they need to know where you are. If you're in a house, they know what address you're at. But if you're on a cell phone, they don't know. So the FCC uh, had a, a um, regulation that all the cell phones had to have positioning um, so that when the call came, they knew where the person was. And in general, the positioning was almost always GPS. So that, that was what drove uh, uh, GPS into phones, I think. So I've done a lot of talking. Um, I'm, I'm done. So uh, let's, let's move over to questions. Um, any other questions we have, Vanessa? Uh, yes, we do actually have a few questions, but in the essence of time, we'll go through a few. And then, um, John, I will send you the rest of the questions. And if you do have time to take these, uh, we can also send it up, send it back out in a follow-up email. Uh, okay. John, is there still a difference between commercial and military systems in regards to accuracy, frequencies, or other? Well, the commercial is fairly accurate now, um, especially uh, with additional sensors and technology. Sometimes your cell phone works even better than the military. In fact, the military is learning. They need to put some of these cool features into their military equipment. Um, but so accuracy is probably not a big player, but the military does have encryption and other information that they can access that is not available for civilians. Hey, thank you. Um, someone have a question about what happens if someone takes out the master control station? There's an alternate in Vandenberg Air Force Base um, and they run regular uh, checks uh, to make sure everything's fully operational. Um, and GPS has sort of a flywheel effect. That is, if suppose it was uh, the station was out for a day, GPS would still operate. Those satellites keep broadcasting. Uh, they don't have to be talked to all the time. Um, we do it. We do it as a regular um, process, but they don't have to have that. Um, they're very much independent and they'll just keep broadcasting signals. Great, thank you. And for our last question, uh, once the DOD force errors were removed, what is the accuracy of GPS? Is it 15M? Well, it's about, you know, three to five meters, but um, it depends on whether you're using single frequency or multiple frequency. If you use single frequency during the afternoons, the um, the ionosphere causes errors up to 30 meters. Um, and so there's a problem with that. But if you can get a dual frequency receiver, then you can cancel that out and uh, then you're on the order of five meter error. Great, thank you. Well, I wanna thank you, John, for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. Uh, thank you to our audience for all of your questions and for attending this event. Uh, we did receive quite a few questions, so I will be sending the ones that were not answered to John so we can uh, send that in a follow-up email. Uh, we will follow up within the next week with a recorded video and presentation material. And our next MUD Talks is how transformative scientific research happens at MUD with Professor Albert Dato on Wednesday, February 17th at 5.30 uh, p.m. Pacific time. An announcement for current parents. Family February is ongoing at this point. Please visit hmc.edu forward slash parents for the schedule of classes, or sorry, schedule of events and registration links. A weekly digest will be sent to you every Monday of all events happening that week. All upcoming events can be found on our online offerings page using the link included in your confirmation email or by visiting alumni.hmc.edu and clicking on online offerings. We welcome any suggestions, suggestions you may have for upcoming events or if you are interested in being one of our speakers, please email us at alumni.hmc.edu. Thank you again for joining us and have a great night, everyone. Take care.